And when Sanjeev asked me that, um, and he gave me the freedom to choose who's the person uh, as an individual I would like to bring from India for his for this meeting, which will for this uh, conference, which will be interesting and learning session for uh, Nepal uh, banking community. Uh, uh, the first person I approached him, uh, and why he has explained. So I'll not get into all the detail and all. Uh, so whether uh, we have about 50 minutes time, uh, 12 o'clock sharp, we'll we'll end. Um, and he said that now the game begins. It's like a WWF <laughs> for you <laughs> and next five years. But I have to uh, get something out of you in the next 50 minutes. I think first thing probably for this, uh, all of us here, would be nice to hear that uh, little bit of your personal stuff, like uh, from a banker from Citibank to ICICI, uh, starting their uh, auto loans and retail segment. You are very aggressive. Those stories, anecdotes, I can't tell you, but how you tried to decimate your previous bank's entire dealership chain in different parts of India in, in, in a very, very, very smart way. And that's how you created the footprint for YCCA Bank at the initial stage. And then uh, getting into an NBFC, owning it partially, and then getting a banking license free. I mean, India banking license is the ultimate something can aspire for. You didn't even apply for it, and you got it on a platter. <laughs> huh? And at Subba said that uh, people call it a merger, but it's actually takeover. You took over an entity which is double the size of yours, no. and it was a management takeover as well. So tell me, I mean, what it takes to become an entrepreneur in the Indian context. Uh, and in financial sector, it's not steel, cement, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where you can just get in and do things. You know, here it's completely different because it's a hugely regulated industry. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody here at uh, Nepal in this audience. Uh, first of all, my uh, request to you: you please discount 90% of what Tamil speaks. <laughs> okay, so his introduction, please dismiss it. It is uh, a really a fantastic merger between a. Uh, uh, well-performing NBFC and a well-performing bank. Uh, number two, uh, with regard to uh, decimating competition and all these words, they don't enter my lexicon at all. It was just the way I see the Indian opportunity. I just feel that uh, when I joined uh, ICICI Bank, uh, that was in uh, 2000, uh, I had already spent 10 years with the Citibank. And like rightly, that's the only portion he said correctly, was that I was running the car loan portfolio in, uh, in ICICI, in Citibank. And when I joined ICICI uh, for the first uh, 10 years, we were building, uh, first, first two years we were building car loans, uh, commercial vehicles, um, home loans, uh, personal loans, and all that. Then 2012, uh, two, there was a merger between ICICI Bank and ICICI Limited. After that merger, I, I became both assets and liabilities uh, head of uh, ICICI Bank of Retail. Then uh, in 2000, uh, fast forward in 2010, uh, uh, like Kamal mentioned to you, that uh, I decided to leave the ICC group. And I just thought that uh, the thinking was very simple uh, to your question. Thinking was that I was building retail banking. I had the expertise, I had the knowledge, I had systems, I had done that for 20 years. So the thought that came to me was, why not make a bank which was only focused in that space? No corporate banking, no innocent banking, no broking, no equity, uh, no international banking, nothing. Just retail banking, 100% retail bank. So then how to make it? Because no existing bank will allow you to make it because they're already there. So then the thought came that why don't we take a stake in a non-banking finance company, even if it is 10%, it's okay. But take a stake, build all retail products into it. Give loans of $200, $500, to small people who want to buy a laptop, a personal computer, uh, a printer, a uh, chair, stable, tube lights. People want to finance these things because if these people went to a bank, normally a bank has no time or space for them. It's too small a loan. So then how to do this facility? We will talk about it later, but then we thought that we will build on that model. So the long and short of this whole story was that build this entity. Now that came of age. Let me say we got 30,000 crores of loan book. But from day one, my idea was to convert it to a bank. So how to convert it to a bank? Only two ways. You apply for a banking license, which was the actually plan A. I never thought of the merger idea. Then somewhere, I don't know, out of the blue, luck strikes. For me, luck has struck three, four times. And out of the blue, one day I got a call and said, can we merge? I said, hooray, 
because I got a bank license. So the whole idea was to just uh, merge and in the process, a license. Now why license? Only because, not because of the prestige or like all the reasons he said, mainly because of long-term funding, which is available for 10, 20, 30 years, hundreds of years, uh, which I suspect uh, NBFC will find it difficult. So this was the whole idea, uh, to get a bank license and finally to build a bank at the bottom of the pyramid, a quality bank at the bottom of the pyramid. No, but that's, I'm just saying, that that's the philosophy. But philosophy. the, the <coughs> instinct of entrepreneurship, like okay. how many bankers have this? Okay, so first so of all. You know, just, to, just to give you an example, at this point of time in India is the full of, you know, flavor is the non-banking finance company. And any and every banker which have gone overseas and made some money for himself or herself in different geographies have come back to India and started an NBFC. But that's a separate story. The money came first, and then they want to use the money and opportunity. But in your case, it's a reverse thing. There was no money, and there was opportunity also like not on a platter, which they are being getting. Uh, so what is the instinct one needs to have to, to become an entrepreneur from a bank in the financial segment? OK, uh, now let me come to your main questions and ask them more directly. My mm -hmm. sense is that I actually get I get very inspired when I see India. Okay. Very inspired because the amount of uh, ecosystem developing at the bottom of the pyramid, even in 2010, in 2010, when we mm. started, there was no word called fintech. Mm. There was no, uh, Aadhaar was not all over the country. Mm. The jam trinity had not yet come. Mm. But the opportunity was there, we could see it. Now to your question, you don't have capital, how do you start? In my case, I actually thought that the best way is to leverage. So what I did was I uh, pledged my house. Mm. And against my house, I got some equity. I bought the stock. The stock also was pledged. So we thought that you could take a NBFC, take even if, it's, if, you, if the stock you acquired is mortgaged to some bank, this model can create so much value that someday you can square off the loan by selling the stock. So what was the instinct? The instinct was that first generation people don't have equity, they can borrow it. Provided the value created from that borrowing yeah. is far higher yeah. than the cost of the leverage. Yeah. So in 2007, what I did was the stock price moved up from about 90 or 100 that I had bought it. It touched 700. Yeah. I sold 1.5% uh, of the company. I got 100 crores. I closed the loan. Okay. So what Subba said is uh, it's the risk taker in you, that is the bedrock of your entrepreneurship? I actually see opportunity seeker okay. uh, more okay. than risk taker. Okay. Because I believe the opportunity was too big and it was not a blind risk taking. Yeah. That's what I, I nuance that. It, uh, mm -hmm. That way, I can't, if you want to take blind risk taking, you can buy, you can leverage and go and buy Colgate, you can go and buy Maruti, you can go and buy some bank. No, here a risk was being taken in A, a space that I knew, B, that I had experience. Three, I knew that route of that world. And four, I believe that uh, uh, this company was undervalued and its value could be created. So I'd say, therefore, I believed more on the opportunity and it was a fair risk reward award. Okay. I think Subha made a mistake. He said that he's recording it and all. So you are a little, uh, you know, circumspect and diplomatic, not as frank as you would have been <laughs> otherwise, which is why you are calling it not a takeover, it's a merger, etc., etc. So it's my job is, as he has made difficult saying this, but coming to this particular merger, tell me, your dream is to get into retail and see, I mean, it's a basically uh, the narration of India story excited you and you have seen that there's a new markets to be created and all. But you are merging with or taking over. Merging with. Uh, merging with an entity which is known for infrastructure financing. So it's a complete, it's a, what an irony. I'm <laughs> just saying, suppose you are taking over another bank, I mean, theoretically I'm saying a listed bank, RBL or something, it's the perfect sync with your business, right? They, they are into retail, big time and new markets and all. But you are taking over an entity which is absolutely the other side of the, you know, uh, North Pole, South Pole difference, where 70,000 crore uh, loan book is completely this infrastructure and project financing. This is a unique entity created by Indian government. I think 1997 budget spoke about it, Mr. Chinambaram's budget, and that's how it got into this and all. And subsequently, it got a banking license, but still 
it is into project financing. So can you tell us, uh, I mean, what, how difficult or how challenging is this merger? I'm not getting into the HR issues and other thing and all, but at a business model level. Uh, okay, it's a very uh, si simple answer in my mind. Uh, yes, uh, close to about uh, 60,000 crores of uh, infrastructure and wholesale banking together is there. Yeah. Uh, and you are comparing, you are saying about 30,000 crores. 30,000 crores of retail bank. Little less than of that. Retail huh. Huh. Hmm. Now, uh, the good news is that the bank in any case hmm. figured out hmm. that infrastructure financing is hmm. not going to be the future of the bank. Hmm. So this is not, I did not have to bring a new philosophy to the bank. They were already thinking. Hmm. And they were already thinking hmm. of bringing a retail, they were what they call retailization of their loan book. Only, only, only one point I'm interrupting. I'm, I, I don't agree with Subha what he said that he has taken his people to learn things from IDFC Bank. It's a great, finest example of bank. I don't agree with that at all. I think IDFC is not, has not done this thing correctly. It's a laggard in Indian financial system. So you have a tough job in hand. Yes, technology is there. It's a very fine on technology. But I don't think it has any plan as such at this point of till now. Since his birth, he has been trying to do different things but he has not been able to find the right path as yet. Let me to that extent, it's not to demean the bank, to that extent that, but and yours is probably a rescue act, so it's a tough job in hand. Tell me what is the business plan? Very simple business plan. Hmm. Uh, the retail bank, uh, we believe, right now is about 36,000 crores when, hmm. put, when you merge the entity. Yeah. We think next five to six years, we can take it to one lakh crores. Hmm. That is coming straight from an area of strength where we are deeply embedded and we are using all new technologies which we will talk about later yeah. to, to build that institution. Mm -hmm. That is growing at 25% per year by itself. So that can continue to grow by 22-25% for the next five years. It can become one lakh crore. Infrastructure we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So there is 30,000 crores of infrastructure. After five years it will become zero. Mm -hmm. So automatically transformed. Okay, so it's a, it's a sort of simple thing. On the liability side, how do you address? Because your strength is the retail loan. I, uh, I, uh, what Capital First brings to the table is your technology, your understanding of that market, your ability to create new markets, new with newer products, and of course the high margin business and all. Absolutely fine. Uh, in contrast, IDFC is a sort of uh, project financing which you are getting into. So essentially, you will replicate your business model there. No? So project financing will become zero. Yes, but on the liability side, you do not have experience much. Uh, no, no experience actually. I mean, in uh, in the for, for as far as uh, capital first is concerned, as a banker, you had experience uh, to create the liability bill, but you don't have any liability. So how do you fill in the liability space? I am not worried about that at all. Okay. Uh, right now, the uh, Casa book is 6,000 crores. Yeah. We think that uh, when we launch, the ecosystem in India has dramatically changed. Okay. I'll tell you what I mean. The, in the last, uh, if our economy today is about $2.5 trillion, about mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago when other, banks, when, uh, when other banks got licenses, it was close to about $1.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Now, in the due course, the economy has only increased 80%. Mm -hmm. And financialization has increased from 8% to 10%. If I do a fast forward for five more years, eight more years, Indian economy will become $5 trillion. Yes. And financialization will become 13 to 15%. So the financial savings of the country will only increase to $750 billion per year then to today. So you have to agree with me, very huge pool of savings is coming. Number two, how do you tap the savings? Very simple. Again, we are going to put branches. We are going to put a lot of technology. Just think of all the technology we brought in the asset side, we will put it on the liability side. It is a very powerful force. Yeah. So technology plus market opportunity plus great UI, UX experience for the customers plus great cust service experience plus good sales team. I tick all five buttons, reach, salespeople, branch, technology, great customer service. I think when you buy five and little more pieces, uh, it will come. You know, I was thinking about this, that if if everybody thinks like this, the new new bank can be set up at all. You will only have ICSA Bank, HDFC, my Access Bank. So new banks can come only when somebody says it can be done. And okay. I, b I really believe, not for uh, motivating our team or anything like that, I really believe it can be done. 
Okay. So uh, you don't see the sort of uh, competing with ICICI, HDFC, the not farm the entrance bank. It is a new, op it's an opportunities that you need to explore. I right? am not going to go head on with any big boys. Okay. They are big boys or big boys. They can stay big boys. They are 7 lakh crore, 10 lakh crore. They are an order of magnitude, which is 10 times our size. Okay. So there is no point. They have their space. They have borrowing at low cost. They're borrowing at 5.3%. They are lending at 9.5%. 9 yeah. We will borrow at 7%. We mm -hmm. will lend at 12%. No problem. Okay, fine. I, I think I understand what you're saying. But tell me, on a, it's nothing to do with HDF, nothing to do with your bank. But at a um, sort of philosophical level, this argument that in a in Indian context, uh, one has to become a bank because uh, NBFC, <coughs> even though <coughs> India probably has the number of NBFCs which is equal to entire world put together, 10,000 odd NBFCs, but they say that NBFCs do not have any future because you do not have access to cheaper funds. That's the way. Now I was, uh, you know, I was talking to one NBFC which is I will not name recently entered into, uh, uh, got into a, a listing. You know, it's a public listed company. Uh, and this gentleman was demolishing the theory, saying, no, it's not correct. I can prove you with numbers. You can be an NBFC, and still uh, cost of fund is not an issue for you, because uh, you have the negative carry of uh, you know, CRR, 4%, uh, SLR, you don't get as much money as you should have otherwise for this 19.25%. And then you have you know, the cost of compliance, uh, and then you have the um, money put in infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really make sense. I'm happy raising money from market at 10, 10 and a half percent because my, uh, I, I'm giving uh, loans at 18, 19 percent. So why should I want to become a bank and get into all these kind of things, compliance issues? Do you see any merit in this logic? No, there is merit in that logic. Mm. And let me just say that every NBFC does not have to become a bank. Mm. There are, I heard this term called the C category, finance companies here, which are non-banking finance companies, and they're working mm. perfectly well in Nepal, for example, the city we are in right now. Mm. Uh, the thing is that if you, there are many fantastic NBFCs in India, which mm. are Sesundaram Finance based at Chennai, who are doing this business for last 30 years, growing at comfortably at 15% per annum, and they are every, every year getting funding, every, they are growing. So mm. it is there an opportunity. Secondly, NBFCs are playing a very important role in India. They are able to do last mile financing, last mile reach, which are many banks also not able to reach. Now, question is uh, a perspective. Mm -hmm. Different people think differently. That is why there's a market. There, mm -hmm. In any stock market, there's a buyer, there is a seller. Mm -hmm. Like that in NBOC, there are different thought schools of thought. My school of thought for our organization was the comfort that came from funding lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in it. Mm -hmm. At least temporarily, we've been proved right. But there are many NBFCs, I believe, who are top-weighted NBFCs who will continue to get borrowing at low cost. So you, you see there's an uh, opportunity for both the sides, it's not necessarily. There definitely, it is because not. Because there is a sort of mini crisis in India in the NBFC sector. A lot of you know, outside people have been asking, is it the end of the road? I'm it not very sure about the Nepal's NBFC landscape. No, land it land is land certainly not the end sense. of the road for NBFCs. I believe the opportunity is just opening up. When India is the same logic, when India will become 2.5 to 5 trillion, how much more for savings, how much more money, how many more banks, how many more mutual funds, how many more insurance companies, how many more provident funds, they will all be there for financing. It will be there. It is a mindset. It, m my security, for me, it is the insurance premium I was paying for becoming a bank because I just felt the peace of mind. Let me also tell you the number of products you can sell to on a banking platform is much better. Okay. Uh, now coming back to uh, the way your way of looking at things or approaching things, you are not into project finance. You are primarily in the retail segment and where technology plays a very critical role. Uh, in compared to India, I think the Nepal banking landscape is very different. We just spoke about some launch of a banking app, mobile app for financial uh, include, I mean, the education, etc. But can you tell us, can you take us through, I think, for this audience, uh, what is your take on uh, how critical it is technology uh, as far as banking is concerned? Because we are, so we have heard that uh, the famous line DBS, which is a Singapore uh, bank, uh, live more bank less. A bank is saying this. Yeah. So I asked Piyush Gupta, what does it mean, live more bank less? It says that uh, we want you to enjoy life more. Don't get into all this kitsch pitch of banking. Banking is so simple now. That's what it says. Technology has made it very simple. So don't waste your time on banking. We are there to help you everything. Technology is there to helping you. So you live more. Enjoy life to the fullest. Don't get into banking come an obstruction for enjoying life. 
We have HDFC Bank in India, which says the banking is a marketplace. The entire thing they are talking about, you know. And we have seen the entire changes. So far, we have been hearing about fintech. Now you are talking about tech fin, mm. uh, like Amazon, you know. There's essentially, the platform is for something else. But now they have also started getting into bank. WhatsApp already applied uh, to, in, uh, to Indian regulator for banking. So you have tech fins, you have fintechs, you have the banks uh, becoming a sort of uh, you know, your marketplace. So in this, all this area, what is the, how technology is changing? How you can use it in a cost effective way? Uh, tell us something which like Nepal banking, which is not technology savvy as yet, Maybe they can have some talking points and take it forward. <coughs> See, uh, what's happening is that, uh, at least in India, the ecosystem around the banking is changing. That is key. And banking is simply integrating into that ecosystem. This is a fundamental issue or a fundamental point. For example, banking or no banking, Aadhaar came for identity. Mm. One ecosystem developed there. Mm. A mobile phone generation came. Mm. It was not came because of banking. It came because of need for telecom communicating with each other. Mm. Then mm. Mr. Modi came with this concept of opening 300 million accounts in a short span of two years. PMJDY. PMJDY. Yes. It, it was coming. Yeah. Now, uh, we were Amazing that we were... 30, 33 crore... 33 crore... 30 30 million odd accounts. Open. Now. Yeah. Now, now, analytics as a base is coming independently. Mm -hmm. Google did not start banking. Google came for doing search engine. And that was an ecosystem coming of its own. Mm -hmm. When social media came, Facebook started social network because not because of banking. They were doing... They were doing social media activity, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, etc. The famous Fang. Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple... Uh, Netflix, yeah. Google. It was F-A-N-G earlier, now it's F-A-A-N-G. Yeah. Now, all of these ecosystems are developing independent of banking. Mm. What is happening is that the ability of the banking system to connect with each of these mm. platforms mm. suddenly has made banking much more transformative. There is when I see the most opportunity. Therefore, what do we mean? For example, we could not give a loan earlier. Any bank, even when we started in 2010, you know, many banks, we, if they went for a loan of, say, 20,000 rupees to buy a computer, banks say, no, it's very expensive, I can't evaluate credit. All these problems went away when this, not banking, but the banking coupled with the ecosystem changed. So in my mind, therefore, this evolution is something, since you're talking Nepal banking, how well Nepal banking connects to the ecosystem will completely redefine uh, 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 the banking of Nepal. No, can you tell me, these are all theoretical things. I just want to know two things clearly. As a banker, how, how your life is changing because of technology in terms I'm of, in terms of Let cost. me tell you, it's, uh, it's not sir, theoretical. Sir, let, let me finish it. I just want hmm. you to give us a little bit of, from the bank's perspective, how is it changing, Help you, helping you to reach out, cut cost, faster, okay. uh, quality of assets, ensuring, and I'm a customer. How my life also is changing. Okay. And lastly, how you are doing this. Okay. Now, let me just say, uh, honestly, this is not theoretical. Hmm. Our ability, we have to make an effort hmm. to connect yeah. in that ecosystem. Otherwise, how will banking be? We have always lived as a banking. We have maybe X number of branches. Customer will come, he'll put the money. Customer will take it away, he'll go away. That is banking, it's been lived for a thousand years. But how will this change to your question? Let me give you a small example. Supposing even in the bank system sitting here, for example, if customer comes to us and says, I want to borrow 30,000 rupees to buy a two-wheeler bike. Now, definitely our ecosystem will not permit it. So uh, the credit capability to evaluate not with a human being, mm. but to use a scorecard mm. to embed into our systems and then take a decision instantly without the intermediary of the employee being there okay. will cut cost by 90%. Okay. So that yes. a transaction that is not viable before mm. will become viable tomorrow. This is a very simple example of how this can be done. Okay. Number two, collections. After all, 
Lending is only lending and collections. Let me talk the second part, collections. Again, I'll give you a very grassroots example. How do we collect? Typically, if you give small loans of 20,000 rupees and all that stuff, the customer return of checks will be very high. Let me tell you about 20% customers check return checks. 20%. You present 100 checks, 20 will come back un unpaid. Now, how do you collect on that? If you go the traditional way of going to the customer's house, collecting when not viable. But in India, I'll give you an example. We have integrated with Paytm. We have integrated with MPSA when it is there. We have integrated with many such wallet companies, integrated the mobile app. When demonetization happened, suddenly we were stuck. Why? We had 5 million customers. Out of that, close to 700,000, 800,000 were returning the checks. How to collect? Big problem. So then we rapidly launched this digitization program of our organization to say how to collect. You will not believe. When this process started, 8,000 people were paying through electronic means, pre-demonetization. Within four months, because of tying up with all these people, that number touched 32,000. Mm -hmm. In January 17, so when people sometimes say, what has happened, where is demonetization, what is the benefit? I am telling you, huge benefit, because customers also changed to pay by electronically. Now, another 18 months have passed from that time. That, that number of 32,000 has touched 160,000 people paying electronically. They come to the internet, they come to the mobile, they come to the... So these are just some examples to tell you how what is not possible before is possible now. Okay. Uh, you touched upon is the alliances. Can you tell me in the entire scheme of things, like earlier, we know that bankers are you know, very <laughs> bloated ego. We know everything, we'll do everything. Any, anybody come, the NVFC wants to have some last mile connectivity, I'll help you. Uh, you rubbish it out, I have been. Uh, but now I think that you know, time has come that you can't uh, play it alone. You have to have number of alliances in different segments to physically reach out to people, the last mile so-called connectivity, to various other technology. For instance, I just came across one company which is done by an I think it's a, it's a U.S. company operating in India. It's called Awaz Day. What does Awaz Day do? It just, uh, you know, makes a call to the customers for collection. I think two days before, 48 hours before the collection, it makes a call in different languages that your X amount of EMI you have to pay on such and such date, get ready in that language. And they charge 30 paise per call. And if that person still does not come back and pay, they don't charge anything. And some of the banks have, it's just one example to what level the alliances can go in this entire ecosystem. So is it the time for alliances, the reinventing banking, the reinventing the wheel in banking? 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually called, uh, uh, because uh, no company uh, can actually get technical specialization in all other lines of business that are required. If you're a car company, to give you a very close example, if you're a car company, you're used to making cars. Mm -hmm. But if some other company has learned how to do route mapping, mm -hmm. another company has learned through technological means how to do um, uh, you know, fuel management expenses. Uh, now, therefore, this car company is just integrating all these five things and now making a new car company. Like that in banking also. If you, banking was lending, buying. But if someone has developed how to do good uh, let me say um, uh, OCR, what we call the recognition of an income document. If someone can see how they can scan an income tax document in a much more better way than a bank can do. Some other en uh, entity has found how you can reach customers in an explosive way on sales better than what bank can do. What bank is now doing, to your example, uh, here's a very fine example actually, is that they're actually connecting these pieces and thus is becoming a new banking. So this is something that not just this country, every country. For example, people of Nepal don't have to take it from there. There are many fintechs in India, for example, providing the services. Hmm. Attach from that fintech, attach with this bank, and hmm. suddenly you will find something new to do which existing banking system cannot do. Today, if a bank from Nepal reaches out to you, today meaning not today, tomorrow or day after, look, uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, he, he, uh, he will not allow him to call him to buy the app. So, so no Mr. Vaidyanathan, why don't you pick up 10% <coughs> stake uh, in my bank? and um, probably uh, I will get technology help from you, probably I'll get to learn uh, different kind of governance, et cetera, et cetera. You will be excited about it? Well, uh, we have to see the opportunity from time to time. Okay. Tell us to the role of the government, because in, unlike Nepal, where 
and there are too many private banks and I'm told that here the corporates are allowed to flow, uh, to have banking set up banking. In India, uh, companies are not allowed at all. We have banking industries 70% uh, by assets owned by the government, right? And the rest 30%, of course it's now coming down and it's not in the best of health, there are a lot of issues and all. So in the entire evolution of this new age banking, where do you see the role of government? Uh, well, the government uh, is playing an extremely important role in a facilitative way. Mm. Fortunately, they are not setting up more banks, saying mm. that I am government, I will do banking. Mm. That would be a bad idea. We learnt a lot. Mm. I mean, uh, it is highly successful in its time. It mm. in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and great banks got made, some of them here. But now, incrementally, we know that's not the way. Mm. So, let me tell you, for example, simple example. Government created Aadhaar. Hmm. Now, if that became the bedrock of now banking, yeah. who imagined? Government implemented GST. Now, government has introduced a new scheme called uh, loan in 59 minutes. Yes. How are they doing loan in 59 minutes? Yeah. They are simply asking MF, uh, SMEs to apply. SMEs, when they apply, they are going and hitting against the GST track record of the employee, of the customer, of the small entrepreneur. Then they are going and hitting three other technologies, and they're saying yes or no. Now, now, why is it possible? Because GST got implemented. Similarly, because go government implemented Aadhaar, new banking opened. Because government rolled out telecom, new banking opened. So therefore, I feel government's role is a facilitative role, government role is a progressive role, and government role is to create ecosystems or facilitate the creative ecosystems. Okay, so indirectly, not directly, don't get into not banking directly, per Not directly, not directly, just create an ecosystem. Okay. We have about 15 minutes more. Are you enjoying? Shall we continue? Is that okay? Huh? We'll also have a few questions so that maybe we can have a, before the last question, you can have a few questions. But tell me, uh, that your entire idea and everywhere is this, you know, the creating new markets. Uh, there are many, I mean, uh, what are the positive people say? A, unlike uh, crooks, corporate crooks, know, who can run away and leave Indian shores, I'm talking Indian context, with thousands of uh, crores uh, taking here. Yeah. Here are the individuals, they're more ethical. And a country like uh, Nepal, uh, they're known for ethics. People are, basically, there are a bunch of honest people there. Mm -hmm. So they think that, yes, it's retail is much more, much more safer bit, even though it's a granular and transaction cost is more, you need to go to that and all. I heard the governor, central bank governor, saying that Nepal's uh, credit to GDP ratio is 90% plus, which is much higher than India's. So India, there's a, uh, there's a huge opportunity to reach out to people, call it mass banking, call it new markets and all. So how do you do that, tell me? Um, I was speaking to people, uh, some of the colleagues. Because uh, they're all unsecured loan. Yeah. And if you only depend on technology, probably it's not the right way. Human touch also is possible, uh, is required. That's what we hear continuously, that it has to be touch and take, not, not take alone. Not even take and touch, it has to be touch and take. Correct. So in this entire thing, uh, technology versus uh, human connect, in creation of new markets, what is your stance? My sense is that uh, India, uh, over the last many years, kept loading and giving more and more credit to large corporates. Hmm. And that went on for 70 years. Hmm. Even large state-owned banks whose original mandate, God knows what it was in 1968 or 70 when it was made, probably it was made to give money to the small people. They also, all the large corporations went and gave only to large corporates. And 40% if the, of the credit of India even today, after five years or of these changes, is still corporate credit. Hmm. About 25% uh, is small entrepreneurs and some is consumer credit. Hmm. And rest is agricultural financing and all that. Hmm. Now, the big change that we will see is to migrate this. We will already see that I think next five years, you will see this 40 and 25 changing to 20 and 45 probably, right? Because small entrepreneurs will get credit. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to therefore the proposition here, mm -hmm. I would therefore say that it doesn't appear to me that Nepal has set up a situation where so much of money has gone to corporate credit, which is actually a good thing. Yeah. Uh, because corporate is, by the way, very important for any economy, huh. but the small entrepreneurs, small consumers are also important. So I think the, uh, the, the so, so, uh, Jap uh, so th uh, these countries which are in the early stage of their uh, credit dis distribution process have an advantage in the sense that they have a chance to directly take credit to the bottom of the pyramid through use of technology. And many such things are opening up. For example, uh, we find that 
a lot of lending. We were stunned yesterday, both you and me, when we were talking over the dinner table to some Nepalese bankers, and they told us NP is 1%. I mean, we had to rub our ears three gross times. Gross NP. Gross NP. Gross Net NP is virtually nil. I was nil, told. they said. Hmm. I mean, we had to scratch our head three times to believe the number, and we hmm. had to ask the same question in three angles to know whether, to say we, we, whether we believe the number or not. Hmm. Now, the thing, therefore, is that if, if that is true, uh, that's very good news because the base is good. Now, uh, therefore, uh, to reach more people through other means of credit, we ask them, how, how do you lend credit? I don't know how far it's true, but I'm told every lending is secured lending. We take property, we take... I mean, there is an opportunity. There, if we always ask security before lending to money to someone, then, then by definition, someone has to become, get a security, then only take a loan. What about somebody who is not capable of, 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 uh, of producing security? Yeah. People who don't produce security are also excellent customers because they have a fundamental business model or they have a cash flow or he's an individual who has the capability to pay back on the basis of salary. So that is a very big market that can spur up more economy at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, uh, tell me this, uh, in India now people are talking about the huge, but before that, uh, that Nepal 1% uh, NPA, that is gross and net NPA actually virtually zero. It's India now 10% plus. In fact, the first time uh, Reserve Bank of India six monthly report, which is a sort of a health check, says that it will come down in March, okay? Sub uh, last few uh, um, uh, few studies, not few, I think last four years studies always, is it, no, forecasting is it will go up and up, but for the first time we hear that it will come down marginally. So what is the NPS scenario if you feel that they're all foreign investors group sitting here? Not exactly that, but I'm okay. saying, what is the story you'll tell that? Is it the over in India, NPS story is over? Yes. We, can only, we can only see better days? Definitely. Uh, there is, in my mind, there is no doubt about it. Huh. Because in 2015, when RBI started the AQR uh, quality review, 15, yeah, all the uh, issues that were there hidden, they came out. Yeah. And I don't think any banker will dare not to disclose the correct NPS today hmm. in hmm. India. Hmm. And therefore, that is all out. And when everything is disclosed, hmm. then it can only come down. Hmm. Why? Because two things happen. Banks at a pre-operating profit, pre-provision -pre level, are making good profits. Hmm. So after two or three years of consistently taking such losses to the P&L, then you're left with no bad loans, it's only you're looking, sitting only operating profit. Hmm. So I think it will improve. Secondly, after everything looks big today. This is the problem, and this is the, this is the size of the book. Tomorrow, this is the problem, this is the size of the book, after eight years, because yes. the book will double, triple because of Indian economy. So same problem will become a very small problem, and see, it's all a reference frame. Yes. So this is looking very big in compared to this. Yeah. But when I take this and put it in front of this, this is yeah. looking very small. Yeah. So this is what will happen to the Indian banking. I think after five years, why five years before that itself, this problem will come. So NPA recognition is over, you are saying? So we are in a recovery phase? NPA recognition is over. Almost it's, over? It's almost over. I think it's, it's practically over. Yeah. Recognition is complete. Yeah. It is only through recovery. We are in a recovery phase We are in a recovery phase, and we are cleaning up phase, taking oh. it through the P&L. Hmm. And finally, like I said, when the GDP will become big, this will become small. Yeah. Incidentally, I think everybody knows there, India has introduced uh, first insolvency code first time. IBC in 2016, and this is a very, very aggressive insolvency code, uh, yes. uh, even by the global standard. Uh, tell me, uh, before I take a few questions, one more question is this. Uh, we in Indian context, all of us, all the bankers talk about the huge uh, unbanked segment where the huge opportunity is the SME segment. The millions of SMEs uh, there, and they, their credit need is not being met at all. But probably the banking system is not equipped to appreciate their, to, to see how it has been met because it's a sort of cash flow based financing, not a balance sheet based financing, which Indian bankers are not familiar with. So how do you actually approach this segment? I think, uh, again, the uh, role of the government is very critical here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I talked about how GST is uh, making trails available because mm -hmm. earlier to finance small entrepreneurs, people ask income tax return. They don't have, in they mm -hmm. have been, if they have income tax return, it's often undeclared mm -hmm. uh, income. So no banker could even evaluate it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is changing. I mm -hmm. think uh, the two things are happening. Every bank you talk to now, this is no exception. Mm -hmm. Every bank you talk to now, they will say, what is your strategy? I want to do retail. I want to do small entrepreneurs. So when 
when 26 private sector banks are talking this and 21 state-owned banks are saying this and State Bank of India is saying this, foreign banks are saying this, definitely action has shifted. Secondly, like I said, role of government introducing GST, including making more white economy than black economy, I think our government has done an amazing job in the last five years, amazing job in formalizing the economy. I mean, mm -hmm. the amount of focus uh, to, to, they in fact gave incentives for people for, mm -hmm. for, for coming, paying through, through the you know, card versus the uh, cash. So basically, that amount of formalization, GST, and everybody's focus, I, I think uh, it will change. Okay. Well, uh, I have a couple of questions, left, but before that, uh, we have little time. So anybody wants to know any, anything from uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, feel free. Ask him. Yeah, so just can can he get the can he get the mic, please, sir? Whoever, just make it brief and please tell, sir. I know I know you personally, but for the house, if you can introduce yourself, so Mr. Vaidyanath also knows that who are you. Huh? Okay, uh, my name is Parshuram Kumar Chetri. I'm the CEO of Janta Bank. Janta Bank Nepal, nothing to do with Bangladesh. Uh, just one correction, we have a category C finance companies, but they are bank, they are non not okay. they are not non-bank. Okay. They are authorized to collect deposits from the general public. Just a small correction there. Right. Okay. Uh, my specific questions to Vaidyanathan is that, you know, okay, people are paying you, uh, uh, paying you through different channels, including digital channels. My question is, how do you handle those who do not pay you at all. You know, my, my question is NPA, man, uh, NPA, uh, NPA management. Is there any ecosystem which is helping you in recovering the money from those who do not pay you? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank Collection. You. It's a good question. Huh. See, uh, we find that uh, the best recourse to, first of all, is to lend more correctly, lend more intelligently. That is the first recourse. Second recourse is to collect. If you collect, then first recourse again is to collect through digital channels and all that. Third recourse is to collect physically. To your question, therefore, we do send people over to customers' homes. We ask them to make the payment. That is a more laborious task. It is an expensive task, but it is a last resort we do when we do. The ultimate resort when customers don't pay through that route also is the courts. Indian courts are very good on this matter. And particularly the last five years, the, uh, the uh, sensitivity of the courts towards lenders uh, uh, is, is very good. And they also understand, if people don't pay here, the next lending is going to stall. So I think that understanding is very important. This happened. So we do collect like that. OK. Any, anybody else? Yeah. Please, can you have the mic, please? After this gentleman, we'll take one more question so that whoever wants can be ready with that. And then I have my last question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Paras Kandan uh, from a small regional bank, Amrubikas Bank. Uh, my question is, uh, in an uh, informal economy, especially in the rural areas, uh, the problem is, I think, the authentication of the documents, let's say the income sources and all that. So how do you think uh, banks are liable to, you know, uh, to what extent should we be verifying uh, the authenticity of the uh, income source, you know, in terms okay. of the legal I, I got the question. Okay, sir. I yeah. got the question. Please, I'll tell you. you what. Thank you. For uh -huh. a bank to try to do all this work is, my honest answer, is almost difficult or impossible. If you are a bank headquartered in Kathmandu and or wherever, you know, in, in any national headquarters and you're going to do rural financing in one village, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible. Now, th therefore, at some point of time, the ability of a bank to grow will be limited by the headquarters thinking about how things could, could be done. Therefore, I feel that if you develop, if we develop partners in all local ecosystems, who understand that ecosystem well, and we partner with them, then we have a much better chance of getting success. 
for example, if there is a small loan banking finance company which is financing in a small territory in a, in a Pat Patiala or a Ludhiana, and we were to fund them and they were to reach that segment, you know, it will be useful. I'll give you an example, and that will be a very telling story. One day I asked one banker saying that, uh, how do you finance buffaloes? And uh, he said, uh, and uh, you know, he said, he, he threw me a rule book about how to finance buffaloes from the headquarters. It's a large bank. I'll not name the bank. And I said, really? And the rule book actually said that buffalo should not, should, buffalo should not have left the place for so much amount of time. The buffalo should not have been unhealthy. The buffalo should not have, you know, should not have, you know, had, the cow should not have already produced three kids. After that, the productivity of the cow will come down. I was thinking to myself, how is it possible for the bank to check, banker to check all these things and give a loan to the cow? So therefore, then we are thinking that by the local manager in that local small NBFC in that market, he knew how to finance cows. He can identify this cow from that cow from that cow. He is able to collect money every day from the farmer. So therefore, if you finance that person and he finances, I feel better. So alliance, essentially what we spoke about the alliance. This is Alliances. the last mile connecting. Yeah. So that's the point. So that's a good example of saying I feel that partnership yeah. alliance. The last good. question. Yeah. Sir, we will have, he will be around. No, no, this gentleman raised his hand before. Sir. Hello. Can I ask one question, sir? No, no, but then you will exceed the time. Is that okay with you? Yeah. I do not know. Because normally I am a stickler for time. So we'll take a one or two more questions. Yeah, please. This is a... Uh, sir, uh, please. Uh, there, there's this gentleman. Okay. Oh. Sir, okay. One question. Achha, let's have all the questions first, then you answer. Yeah, no, sure. I, I'll keep it short. But answering. this one a little uh, offbeat quick. question. Huh. Yeah, this is a offbeat question. I am hmm. uh, representing, uh, representing Nepal Bangladesh Bank. Hmm. So, uh, using the technology and Wi-Fi here and just searching Google, I got to know that you have deep interest uh, running a marathon. You have almost run uh, 22 marathons so far. Uh, 7 is full and 15 is half marathon. How do you correlate your interest and in marathon to your uh, successful career? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. a personal question, but no. you have to <laughs> good, good. Very good. It's, it gives a different dimension uh, to the uh, Shalo, Thank yeah. you. Uh, let us go back to digital platform. Uh, okay, Hari sir. Huh. Okay. So just no, quick, quick answer. Uh, uh, no, no, no. The quick uh, this one. is Hari Prashad. Uh, this is Hari Prashad. My uh, question, uh, in fact, I do not have a question. I just have a curiosity. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. My curiosity is, uh, uh, you said that the business opportunity inspired you to set up your, uh, you know, NFT, this first bank. But what would have happened if the people's need had inspired you to set up this uh, institution? Would there been any difference in your governance system if it had inspired you, people's need had inspired you to set up the organization. Thank you so much. Okay. For Thank you. Quickly, no, sir. second okay. question is very easy to answer, actually. Mm -hmm. It's always connected. What is opportunity is someone else's need. In fact, there is a need, there is an opportunity. So really, I don't see a difference between the two. Actually, it is connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it's not only opportunity. It is in small entrepreneurs, we feel that big entrepreneurs already well banked. So small entrepreneurs is a need and opportunity. So the first question, the uh, thing is that I don't, uh, the way I think about it, this brings a lot of discipline. I have no phenomenal uh, connections between business and, and marathon running. I just ran the 30th marathon last, last, last uh, year, uh, last month uh, of, of my life, of which eight were full marathon and 22 was half marathon. Uh, but the, uh, there is uh, only connection is that I have never taken sick leave for the last 25 years of my life. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it just keeps me fit. And I don't overdo it uh, in the sense uh, I, I try not to do it so much to an extent that I go mad. But I believe 21 kilometers is comfortable. Uh, and actually, you know, he had a lot of interesting dimensions of his character. And next time, Subha, when you take your people to Mumbai, take his to his capital first office, there is a cricket pitch. <laughs> and where we played cricket, he couldn't get me out. You know, he thought that I'm an old man, you know, it's, I'll not be able to <laughs> bat. But actually, I batted bravely, in, you know, through this visionary and risk-taking and entrepreneur. He could not get me out for about a <laughs> couple of hours or more than that I played. I actually, after the way he played, I called him Rahul Dravid of India. 
Okay. Acha, the last question this gentleman was raising his hand. Yes. Yeah. Last question. I'm just. Uh, hmm. I'm from. Uh, I'm Lekhnath Rusal from Nepal Bank Limited, Nepal's first bank. Uh, my query is very specific, but I think it will indicate uh, and give some lessons for us. Uh, in India, uh, we know that uh, in recent years there is alarming NPA level, hmm. and uh, uh, we wanted to know that whether it is. Uh, due to banks haphazard lending or due to regulators or government regulated uh, lending provisions. In Nepal, as we know that our spreads are squeezing and banks have to uh, significantly increased, uh, increase their uh, business mm -hmm. and balance its size. So what lesson could we learn from this event? Thank Can you. expand his question if you may? I could not exactly, I couldn't follow. Somebody else? India has a NPA perspective and a lesson learned uh, uh, from Fro this. Okay. Okay. What yeah. initiative yeah. Nepal okay. can okay. take? Yeah. Got it. Okay, let me oh, ask got your point. Yeah. Now I got the question. What can Nepal learn from India in the field yeah. of banking? Yes. I would actually quick, quickly say that uh, if Nepal can set up a unique identity for every citizen, and connect it like how India connected it with UIDI, it will revolutionize Nepal banking. Uh, with other, uh, because other Sorry. than that, hmm. your mobile phone connection is there, your artificial <coughs> intelligence, you will source it from the cloud from somebody. We don't have a unique identity. If you build that, that's a very missing, missing piece, and that will change Nepal banking. Yeah, last question from me uh, is whether, because this, uh, the central theme of this entire seminar of 10 years of this thing, and rightly so, uh, governance, ethics, and integrity. Now, in, in Indian banking system now, we are sort of a situation where questions are being raised on these issues. Traditionally, we see the public sector banks, which is about 70% of the industry, are not well governed for multiple reasons. Political influences, governance interference, uh, not so competent boards, so on and so forth. But now we have seen that it has even spilled over to the private sector. I'm not getting into any particular instances. Everybody knows that. But can you tell us, how do you ensure governance? What is your idea of how do you make it happen? And not only you, you, ca you are a CEO, you can, but how you instill that spirit among your thousands of employees. Okay, my co quick comment is first of all that, um, uh, is that everybody by now knows that well-governed companies last longer, better valued, and employees have more pride. Therefore, governance is also, as everybody knows, or good integrity ethics, of course, comes from the heart, but also makes fantastic business sense. And therefore, uh, you know, when we communicate to employees, employees instinctively understand that. If employees are working with an organization which they know that my leadership is not clean, or if my leadership is compromised some way, or they bribe, or they do wrong things, employees not proud sharing his, that brand name with his community, with his family, with his friends. So therefore, I think employees will automatically, naturally participate if the concept is of governance is uh, instilled. Thank you. I think we could have gone one more hour, but um, the next session will start. Uh, so thanks for your patience. Thank you, Vedanathan, to Thank accept you. my personal invitation <laughs> and Subba's organizational invitations to be here. And Thank big you. hand for him, please. And to you. I think we have all yeah. enjoyed. Uh, Thank you so much, um, just Mr. Vedanathan. Just before, just before we start, I just want to yeah. say that uh, we love this country of Nepal. I love it. I've been here like 20 years ago. and. Uh, it's, 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 it's India's closest friend, just neighbor. There is no visa required to this country. We just feel at home here. We love it. And I loved our stay here for the last 24 hours. We sincerely thank you and for, thank you for your hospitality and thank you uh, for, for all of you.